Happy Friday. How you doing? Welcome or welcome back. I'm Leslie Marshall. Welcome back and thank you for joining us, whether you're listening or watching. I have not one, not two, but three great guests. And um, I really, really love uh, what we're going to be talking to our guest about today. Uh, and, and I want my guests to know why, if if uh, our pub- shared publicist hasn't told them that yet. Uh, we're going to be joined in just a moment by, not like I said, one, two, but three great men and co-authors of How Millennials Can Lead Us Out of the Mess We're In. A Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian share leadership lessons from the life of Moses. It's going to be released on October 20th. It's available right now on Amazon.com for pre-order. Um, we'll get to those authors in one sec, but I wanted people to know. Uh, Many of you know, um, I have a Jewish parent, I have a Christian parent, and I have a Muslim husband. So uh, this uh, actually uh, tugs at my heartstring. My kids aren't millennials yet, uh, but definitely uh, the product uh, of, uh, uh, at least culturally, three religions. More than a pleasure to have these three gentlemen and co-authors with us. Rabbi Mordecai Schreiber, Dr. Iqbal J. Unis, uh, Unis, excuse me, and Reverend Ian Case Punet. Uh, more Punnett. than a pleasure to have you with us, Rabbi. I'm sorry, Mark. Punnett, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, more than a pleasure to have the three of you with us, Rabbi, uh, Doctor, and Reverend. More than a pleasure. Welcome to the program. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking the time on this Friday. Well, you could have saved us all a lot of trouble and written this book yourself. Um, so <laughs> you really, you're really kind of letting us down to find out that somebody else should have been doing this, but hadn't been. So <laughs> we only wrote it because you, you know, were asleep at the switch. So we finally knocked one out for you. So well, I can tell by the caller you're the reverend, and uh, we will be seeing we, all the other gentlemen. Ian's, Ian's so, fine. We, we just prefer okay. Ian. That's fine. Once you speak, first of all, Reverend, why don't you start it off? Um, whose idea would the it was this? And, you know, because at, at first it sounds like a joke, right? A Muslim, a Jew, and and, and a, a reverend, a Christian walked into the bar, a bar. Uh, but wh- whose idea was it and, and why? Well, Dr. Yunus gets credit for this. So uh, he had written a, a small version um, of the of the concept of talking about Moses in, in you know understanding him from a Muslim perspective in terms of leadership, and he contacted me and asked whether I might help you know sort of broaden the appeal of that a little bit. And I said I thought the best way to do it would be to also then bring in a rabbi so that we could all be talking about it from you know slightly different positions, but also look for that unified voice. And that we decided to write it as just one voice. So you can't really ever tell who is saying what in the book. Dr. Yunus, I'm wondering because you had started with the idea and you had started with the idea of Moses, um, uh, why you chose uh, Moses, because there are a lot of uh, great uh, leaders and uh, biblical characters or or prophets uh, that are shared uh, by all three of the big three. Uh, you know, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Doctor? Well, um, one obvious thing is the uh, commonality, the the link between the three religions is the life of Moses. Uh, The lawgiver and uh, uh, in the the Quran itself, uh, Moses is spoken of much more than any other of the prophets. Uh, His story, his narrative is covered in several chapters over and basically in different uh, parts of his life. Uh, that's one con- one idea. The other idea was, if you look at it, really, from a leadership perspective, Moses' life is much more detailed in terms of the specifics, his specific actions, the specific uh, role he played at different times in life that you could pick up and turn them into lessons that are uh, timeless and a piece to the contemporary. Uh, and my... Uh, personal interest in looking at Moses that, at the, in, to begin with was really that, to look for leadership, leadership lessons in the story of Moses. Uh, the reason I do that is believing that people who are exercising leadership would have a greater appreciation for it if they could tie it to their basic belief systems. And that's where Moses' life comes in. Thank you. Um, Rabbi, um, you know, let, let's talk to a Jewish man about, a, a, you know, a Jewish man, Moses. Um, what was your response, um, you know, to, to this idea? And wh- what did you think could be brought to the table in modern day 
um, in learning about, you know, a, a, a somebody who was such a great leader spiritually and otherwise as Moses. Rabbi? Yes. Uh, I've always been aware of the great divide that we, of the three religions, managed to create among us, which led to a lot of unnecessary wars and bloodshed and suffering. And as I'm getting older, it's become so clear to me that we need a common denominator to bring us together, a unifier. Yes. Divisiveness is uh, lethal for today's world, but we see it everywhere, not just in the United States. I see it in my native Israel. People are very divided. And uh, just using two examples, it's, it's everywhere. And here we found a, a historical figure that nobody can challenge, except that today I had a posting on Facebook and somebody told me that this book is a Jewish plot. So I, I wrote him back and I said, yeah, you know, uh, blame the Jews. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I answered him, I said, in, I said to him, when in Arabic, doubt, blame the Jews. Yeah. <laughs> I said, ya Habibi. Ya Habibi in Arabic mean, my dear one, you know, don't be so cynical. Let's have a sulcha. Sulcha in Arabic means what? Iqbal? Make, you know, make nice, make peace. Enough already with this nonsense. Right. So I'm, I'm getting a lot of reactions on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook that are very supportive and very excited about the book. But I also get the other side. Yeah. People who think that, you know, who, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to do this? Well, somebody gives me the right. Yeah. Well, and uh, uh, Re Re Reverend, I wanted to ask to uh, to that point that, um, you know, your your book I read is quote, meant for sincerely spiritual but church-resistant Bible readers. Would you agree with that, Reverend? And if so, why? And why do you think the bu the book would appeal to uh, th that group within oh, the group? Oh, we designed it that spiritual. way because there's, especially with regard to millennials, the idea of, I mean, I think it's kind of an obnoxious term, but people refer to the unchurched, which I, I don't care for because it I think actually church is everywhere and people right. get all sorts of church, you know, but um, it, it's really for the bookstore faithful in the people that like to read it in their own terms and in their own way. And that was our lens from the very beginning. In fact, we make several nods um, to atheists and agnostics in the book because we still think that these lessons are timeless and that they're beneficial regardless of whether you have any faith at all. Um, and and so it isn't just a matter of that. But, uh, but then again, I, as I just learned today, it was a Jewish plot. So it changes everything. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> Isn't everything an over, a Jewish plot? People well, used to say that when, when well, Jews run the world, you know, said, we own everything. We, it's it's we not just that, Rabbi. There's a wor Jewish world order to th overthrow yeah. the world, right? Yes, we have private both, meetings. And there's a Zion, you know, yeah. they're sitting there plotting. I know, yeah, gonna, them, but you know. Uh, yeah, we're going to take a break. I'm sorry. I hate interrupting a, a rabbi, so forgive me. God forgive me. Uh, we will be back with our three wonderful guests uh, and this wonderful book right after this. Hey, Dad, how do airplanes fly? What's in this box? Can I touch this? That's pretty Where funny. Where does sand come from? Is this tree good for climbing? What happens if I mix these two things together? How are babies made? What does this thing do? Kids are curious about everything, including guns. Talking to them about gun safety in your home is a good first step, but you can do more. Always keep your guns locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition. Storing your guns securely is the best way to prevent family fire, including unintentional shootings. For more information on safe gun storage and ways to keep your family safe, visit endfamilyfire.org. That's endfamilyfire.org. What do we keep in the attic? What's this thing called? Can I ride my bike backwards? Like I said, kids are curious. It's up to us to keep them safe. Brought to you by N Family Fire, Brady, and the Ad Council. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. 
Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Who, me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. <sighs> Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. There's a hunter's nightmare in which a group of them flush some rabbits out of the brush. But rather than scampering away, the furry bunnies turn toward their stalkers. Run, shouts one of the hunters. Run for your life, the rabbits have guns. Arming animals would make the sport of hunting a bit more sporting, wouldn't it? Well, what if we did give all wildlife a fighting chance against the destructive firepower of profiteers who so carelessly ravage their habitats and kill them off? Of course, we can't arm nature with guns, but we could recognize that other species and ecosystems are living creatures with intrinsic legal rights to exist and flourish, thus giving nature its day in court to defend its own well-being. Like us humans, the lakes, forests, wildlife, etc., could have legal status to sue and be represented by lawyers to protect themselves from mindless exploitation, injury, and death. This rights of nature concept is already being applied in such countries as Ecuador and New Zealand, and more than three dozen U.S. cities and towns have passed ordinances acknowledging that various natural resources in their areas have inherent rights to take polluters and other despoilers to court. Ironically, the corporate powers, who have perverted law, logic, and nature to have their lifeless profiteering entities declared persons, are aghast that Mother Nature can have rights that can counter the corporate claim that their right to profit is absolute. This is Jim Hightower saying, At its core, the rights of nature movement is asserting the obvious. Earth's biosphere is not a free candy store for our taking. We are one with the natural world and must find ways to cooperate fully with it for our own survival. To learn more and connect to action, go to Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, www.celdf.org, celdf.org. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of truth. The Leslie Marshall Show. back with our guests. There are three authors, co-authors of How Millennials Can Lead Us Out of the Mess We're In. A Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian share leadership lessons from the life of Moses. By the way, like I said, you can pre-order that book. Go now and pre-order it. I'm going to get this book. I want it. Uh, go to Amazon.com. And the release, if you like to venture out with your masks and social distancing in stores, and you should, will be on October 20th. But in the meantime, pre-order now. Amazon.com. Uh, do as I do and say today. Uh, more than a pleasure, like I said, to be back with Rabbi Mordecai Schreiber, Dr. Iqbal J. Yunus, and Reverend Ian Case Panette. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for holding uh, there and uh, for, for, for being with us today. Um, one of the things that I noticed, um, you know, from, you know, reading snippets and, you know, press releases on the book is that it attempts to synthesize the religious views of Judaism, Islam, Christianity into one unified, harmonious voice. Uh, and I love it, singing a, a single hymn. Um, right now, we're very divided politically. Uh, we're divided uh, socially. Uh, we're divided along lines of color, it would seem. We have some racial imbalance and certainly some anger over uh, racial injustice. Um, how, how, how do you feel, um, uh, doctor, uh, that, you know, that people today can take that uh, unified message, if you will, from Moses in, in those times into modern times like today? Well, um, first of all, as far as the people who believe in either in, in, in any of these three faiths or other faiths would uh, want to look at it from the belief point of view in the sense that they want to go back and see, okay, 
where is the divine message coming from? If I believe in a divine, where is the divine message coming from? And the divine message comes through divine messengers. So the natural the next question will be, okay, who are these divine messengers? And which of these divine messengers can I easily access? And the e most, the easiest uh, messengers access in the case of, of the interaction of these two religions is of course Moses uh, uh, as, as the uh, beginning uh, or you know, being of the, of the law that, uh, the divine law that uh, was revealed to him. Now, uh, the, how, how does it relate to the times that we are in? That is the question that uh, people would ask. Well, I mean, the answer would be that we need to realize that even though times have changed, we haven't changed in terms of the human nature. The human nature is, is there. And, you know, there are a few changes that are in, impacted, impact of social uh, environment that we're in. But we need to realize that in human nature and the, and the lessons that we could learn from the uh, quote-unquote ancient are really timeless. And our job is to look at those lessons and see how we can apply them in the circumstances that we are in. But the lessons themselves are timeless. Interesting. Um, a rabbi, um, I want to talk about the Middle East and specifically peace or lack. Um, uh, my understanding is that the, the, the three of you are on the same page in the sense that the new initiatives with regard to actually fall short of, of solving uh, the main problem. Uh, uh, obviously, one is uh, statehood for the Palestinians. Um, if, if, first of all, I, I wanted to, I'm not, you know, trying to just target you and get your opinion on it because you are the Jewish man at the table. You did say you're from Israel. Um, and uh, I, I was wondering, do you think that your of unity could move the needle um, on the conversations that need to be had in and surrounding the Middle East, the Middle East peace process, and specifically Palestinian statehood. Leslie, from your, I, I, I hope you're being heard, because I, I pray every day that at long last the children I grew up in Haifa, beautiful city on the Mediterranean, Arab children, Christian children because the British were there. We was a British before the state started. I was there, I remember it. And us Jewish kids born there, first generation natives, we got along fine and everything was great. And then everything fell apart. And to this day, it's over 70 years later, we have drifted away and you know, Business agreements with Bahrain and with the Emirates, let alone uh, our advanced arms agreements, is not a solution Correct. to our human, human problem. Because like the doctor said, we all have the same human nature. We all have the same abilities. Nobody's superior, nobody's inferior, you know. And particularly a little country like Israel, surrounded by an ocean of Islam and Arabs, etc., must find a way to integrate itself from a social, cultural, and, and, and any point of view, and become part of the Middle East, and let the Palestinians have their own state, because there's room for a Palestinian state, there's room for, for Israel. And unless and until this process begins, everything else is simply barking up the wrong tree. But I want to jump in and just ask one more question, Rabbi, if you don't mind, just to that point. Um, I've been to Israel, I've been to Haifa, I went to McDavid's in Haifa. And, uh, I, okay. and, uh, and as a matter of fact, I'll tell you something funny you'll like. Um, I, was, I was just, uh, to, I was told when I was there um, that in Haifa you work, in Jerusalem, you pray, and in Tel Aviv, you play. Uh, when I was when I was in Israel uh, years yeah. ago, but but to your point, um, it, you know, regarding uh, you know human beings and everything you've said, you know, just 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 absolutely beautiful. We read a lot of polls. You hear a lot of things that people say uh, in Israel. Is your mm -hmm. experience that now in 2020, Israelis are divided on this because 
I hear a lot of people talking like you in all different generations regarding Palestinian statehood. You know, when I was in the early years of the state, we had great goals and great ideals. And our, even our founders, our great leaders talked about peaceful coexistence with the Arab world. And what happened over the years, our population, there were only half a million Jews in Israel in 47. Now there are six and a half million. The, the, the vast majority of what today we call Israelis either came from the former Soviet Union when they never lived under democracy, when they don't understand the nature of coexisting with other people. And the other main group came from the Arab world where most of these countries didn't, didn't have democracy either. So we have a very serious political cultural problem in Israel that there is a distrust of democratic institutions. There's a distrust of people getting together. There are misconceptions about you can, you can make peace with the Arabs. The Arabs only have one objective, and that is to throw us into the sea and get rid of us. And nothing is further from the truth. It's yeah. not the truth. And so I'm not the only one who says that. But unfortunately, the majority of Israelis still are not, haven't, haven't gotten there yet. They're not right. there yet. And that's a <laughs> yeah. problem. Uh, very well not said. Uh, very well said. Re uh, Reverend, I wanted to ask, uh, because all three of you um, are men of a, a different religion, and, and cer certainly um, all three of you, I would imagine, have uh, better theological chops than the, uh, you know, the average, uh, you know, uh, non-religious uh, leader. Um, did you learn anything about Moses that maybe when you were researching and writing this book with these two gentlemen that you didn't know before, this great book, How Millennials Can Lead Us Out of the Mess We're In? I, I wouldn't have taken on the project if I wasn't interested in learning. <laughs> so ah. uh, that's a goal, a daily goal. And I think what you have here already, and just in, in hearing this conversation, here you have an, is a man who was born in what became Israel. So he's the rabbis older than Israel. Dr. Yunus was born in a part of British India um, before it was Pakistan. So he's older than Pakistan. And I'm only older than you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing I'm older than. <laughs> and so the whole, the whole experience is about learning. And I think that if I can, I mean, I think that in finding that it wasn't a matter of like, we had to pretend we didn't believe something or we had to cut things off. And it wasn't really a very difficult negotiation. I was coordinating a lot of the writing. Um, and what was interesting is I would often forget who wrote what. And I'd have to go back to the title on the email to see whether it was from Dr. Yunus or from Rabbi Schreiber. Interesting. Then, uh, Reverend, hold that thought. We have a break, but I'm coming right back to you. You have the floor true. and you will have it on the other side of this quick commercial break. I'm trying to give all you guys uh, equal time because uh, I, I, I know I'm just I'm very fascinated, uh, you know, by this. Uh, I, I really, really um, want people to get the book. And like I said, I'll tell you more about it and we'll be returned in a moment with our guests. America, your children have an amazing superpower. They can help save lives by not having play dates. That's right. By replacing get togethers with virtual play dates and video chats, they can help slow the evil spread of germs. And if your superheroes do go outside, make sure they continue their superhero wing by staying six feet away from others to protect everyone in America land. Find out more at coronavirus.gov. A message from the CDC and the Ad Council. America, your children have an amazing superpower. That's right. They can help save lives by simply washing their hands. Just 20 seconds of thorough hand washing after they've coughed or sneezed or been outside can help fight against the dastardly spread of germs. Armed with only soap and water and hands, your superhero can protect you, your family, and everyone out there in America land. Amazing. Find out more at coronavirus.gov. A message from the CDC and the Ad Council. He was the heart of your family, and he taught you our history. He helped you fix your first flat. He was the best backyard DJ around, and every time he'd tell a story, he'd own the room. But now more than ever, he may feel alone. 
Today, older adults and their loved ones are struggling to connect in a time when connection has never been more important. But there is something we can do. Embrace our older loved ones through StoryCorps Connect. With StoryCorps Connect, you can honor seniors remotely with an interview about their life. Every interview will be archived at the Library of Congress, becoming part of American history, so that years from now, future generations can listen in. All right, Grandpa, what's one piece of advice you have for me? Just three words, sweetheart. Live with courage. The man that had the best stories still has plenty of stories to tell. So connect virtually and share the conversation of a lifetime at StoryCorpConnect.org slash AARP. Connect, honor, share. StoryCorp Connect. A message from AARP, StoryCorp, and the Ad Council. Welcome to Code WAC, your podcast on America's broken healthcare system and how Medicare for All could help. I'm your host, Brenda Gazar. Today, we'll talk about one immigrant's experience battling the coronavirus. Angelica Salas is the longtime executive director of CHIRLA, which she transformed into a mass membership immigrant-led organization, empowering immigrants to win local, state, and national policies that advance their human, civil, and labor rights. Welcome to Code Whack, Angelica. Do you have a story you can share with us about a Latinx immigrant who has suffered during the coronavirus pandemic? Guillermo was such an active member of CHIRLA. He was one of those members who been fighting for immigration reform, for licenses so undocumented immigrants could drive. He was always in our protest, making sure that the immigrant voice was lifted up. And he and his wife became extremely active in our fight for immigrant justice. It was just so sad to see him pass away too. He was a construction worker who picked up the virus in a cons- at the construction site. It was the workers who actually let him know that another worker had also tested positive, but was also very ill in the hospital. He had been in very close contact with this worker, and he had obviously pre-existing conditions too. He had been sick before, he didn't have access to healthcare. And so what happened is he very quickly had to be intubated and and he passed away. He died undocumented. Uh, Immigration reform never came, access to healthcare never came. And so it's time that we actually uh, help these families. Find more Code Whack episodes on ProgressiveVoices.com and on the PV app. You can also listen to Code Whack at heal-ca.org. This podcast is powered by Heal California, uplifting the voices of those fighting for healthcare reform around the country. I'm Brenda Gazar. If you miss Leslie on TV this week, catch up at lesliemarshallshow.com. We are back. Welcome back. I'm Leslie Marshall. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we go back to these three great gentlemen who wrote a fantastic book, which you need to pre-order and pre-order now on Amazon.com. It'll be released on October 20th. It's entitled How Millennials Can Lead Us Out of the Mess We're In. A Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian share leadership lessons from the life of Moses. Like I said, we're joined by Rabbi Mordecai Schreiber, Dr. Iqbal J. Hunis, and Reverend Ian Case. Panette. Uh, Reverend, thank you for holding. Welcome back, uh, all three of you. But uh, Reverend, you have the floor, I said, and I asked you and you were uh, talking about things that you learned about Moses in research and in writing this book that maybe you didn't uh, know before, and especially maybe looking at him with regard to today's political, social, uh, and racial imbalance. I think what what may even be, I'll even take it a step further and say, I don't think most people who are non-Muslim realize how much of the of the Quranic narrative follows the biblical narrative. And they may imagine all these different things that they think they've heard that are in the Quran and, and that it's all about, you know, murdering people and it's all about, and and abuses that go on for all religious texts, right? That these, our, our, our religious traditions are, are often used against ourselves and people will pull them out and yell at us with chapter and verse. I think that was the most beautiful thing was to see just how close and when they were different, when the, when the, when the, the Hebrew narrative of Moses differs from the Muslim narrative or the Quranic narrative of Moses, it's so informative. It's so interesting to see where the points 
most of them just touch, right? They just were like right along almost like very parallel. But when they diverge, they diverge for the most interesting reasons, which is part of what I think is the most interesting reading about the book for anybody who would want to understand the Moses narrative in a more universal context. That's uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I like I like I like that. And one thing, having come from two different backgrounds and marrying into another, I definitely have seen a lot more similarities than differences. Yeah. But you know, differences make the headlines, right, and not the similarities. Um, uh, a, a doctor, I I wanted to ask you similar. Um, you know, certainly, you know, you know, your faith uh, of Islam. You know, having you know embraced Islam, and I imagine being brought up in that. Uh, being in British India and now Pakistan, um, did you um, find maybe similarities or did you find some things out about Christianity or Judaism that maybe you didn't know in researching and, and writing this book with your uh, two co-authors, uh, you know, surrounding Moses and, and the theme for the book with regard to Moses and millennials? Well, definitely. Uh, there's a lot that I I, did, I thought I knew, but I didn't know. Um but one important point I think uh, we need to make is this, and I think the, the book makes that point and we all agree on that point, that regardless of the events and circumstances and actions and things like that, it is the lessons that we need to focus on. So while the narrative may differ a little bit, you know, with this detail or that detail and this happened at this time and this happened at a different time, we need to focus on what is the lesson in there? What is the message? The divine message that is coming through. And so if you look at it that way, then you don't think of these as differences. You think of these as simply different narrations, which are actually tying the same thing. They, are, they, are, they have the same thread running through them. For example, okay. we talked about the, uh, you know, the, the difference of what was the age of Moses when, you know, as, as, as Christianity describes it in, his, in the Quran, the Quran doesn't mention the age, but what does it matter? because the lesson is the important thing. So I, I guess that's a very important lesson that we should learn. And if we always look at the divine messages the, uh, uh, from that perspective, what is the lesson? What is the divine teaching? Instead of focusing on the details and little this difference with that difference, then we'll be all better off. Rabbi, uh, in the fourth chapter, I believe it is, um, of your book, How Millennials Can Lead Us Out of the Mess We're In, um, uh, there is a discussion of a ruthless, overbearing tyrant versus a humble servant leader. And I thought it was very interesting, especially when we have an election coming up in November and how uh, our current president is viewed by some, how Joe Biden is viewed by some, um, how leadership in general here and throughout the world are viewed by some uh, versus the masses, we the people, uh, the voters. Um, uh, I, I would love you, uh, uh, sorry, it's chapter three. My apologies, not chapter four. Uh, I would like you to speak to that, Rabbi. The, the book isn't out yet, so we haven't read it yet. So we're looking forward <laughs> to reading the book when it comes out. <laughs> okay, Reverend. Uh, Rabbi, chapter three, which you didn't know, uh, talk to us about that ruthless, overbearing tyrant yeah. versus that humble servant leader. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a wonderful concept. It's as old as time. One of my favorite uh, figures in history is Ab Abraham Lincoln, the most one of the most admired humans that ever lived, and he was humble. He was modest, and uh, I know that in the African American community, the concept of a uh, servant leader is very prominent, very prominent, and we all need to learn from it, because oppressed people, and African Americans certainly have been oppressed, and we Jews also have been oppressed. We were slaves in Egypt in the time of Moses. And we, I don't need to tell you about the Holocaust. So <laughs> oppressed people have a sensitivity and an awareness, and great leaders do too. And those who were born with a silver spoon in their mouth and nev ne never saw, never, never suffered any want or any, those people cannot understand the human heart. So this is the key. Uh, I'm not saying that Biden is, is the greatest leader in the world, but I will say one thing about him. He's all heart. I love that. That in, in itself is a divine gift. Okay, he, you know, Roosevelt, um, Lincoln, etc. These were giants. Uh, you know, we don't get giants very often, but, but we all need to be human. 
Otherwise, forget it. Absolutely. Reverend, on that point, speaking of being human, some would say we also need to be humble. Moses w was humble. And uh, you guys talk about in chapter four, this is uh, chapter four. I had my uh, chapters uh, reversed. Uh, Moses and the miracle of humble leadership. And I think that's essential today uh, when we have so many leaders, not just our own president, but throughout the world who certainly have forgotten humility. Reverend? Well, this is where actually a very direct tie into to the millennial piece of the book is there, it, there was no sense of autocracy. He was not, even though he was given the agency to do it that way, he saw his role as a unifier. He saw that it would benefit everybody if he brought in his brother, if there were other people, if he got a buy-in from the community when they went to Egypt. And this was the idea of building something, not just owning it, but building something that they could all lead together, which would then make it easier for him to pass it along when his turn at the top was ending. And that's kind of the beauty and why we think that relates a lot to the that millennial understanding of building coalitions and having companies where there's a shared understanding and not just this top-down authority, uh, always saying, well, this is what you have to do if you want to earn your money this week. But this is why we're doing what we're doing. This is this is the this is the cause behind our success. And that's what Moses led with. Awesome. Doctor, quickly, because I want to get both of you uh, 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 in addition. Sorry, my new puppy. Uh, doctor, um, uh, you talk in, um, the three of you uh, write in, about in chapter six, Moses and leadership lessons learned in times of tyrants. Uh, doctor, if you could just name one lesson, because I don't want to give the book away. I want people to buy the book uh, because we certainly have a lot of tyrants out there. One lesson uh, learned uh, from Moses and leadership in a time of tyrants. Okay, uh, one lesson, uh, for example, uh, and again, it applies to the time of tyrants, it applies to all times, is the idea of justice, the idea of giving the other side uh, an opportunity to explain. And it, it may seem very little, uh, you know, when you read it, but when you think about it, when uh, Moses went away and the, the, the Israelites, you know, you know, the story of the calf, the golden calf and so on. And when he came back, he was very upset because people were worshipping this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this statue. And everybody knew, at least in the Quranic version, who was responsible for this. That was a man called Samri. And one would think, okay, so it's easy to judge, you know, punish him. But Moses asks him, what is your story? The idea that you do not judge people before you give them a chance to to present their side of the story, this uh, idea of justice, even in the in the face of such difficulty, is very important. Actually, wonderful, uh, Rabbi. Um, I want to, very quickly. Um, uh, chapter five, Moses. Oh, we have thirty seconds, so we uh, we are out of time. I love I love you guys. I love you guys so much. I really do. You're, you're awesome. You. Uh, the book is How Millennials Can Lead Us Out of the Mess We're In. It will be released October twentieth. It is available for pre order now. Please get it pre pre order it on Amazon.com. You can get hardcover or Kindle edition. And Doctor, I lived in Pakistan. I lived in Karachi for four months, and I adopted my son from the ED Foundation, and I know the EDs quite well, and I know that you, a Pakistani, uh, would know them as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I want to say uh, thank you uh, to, to everyone. I should have said hello, assalamu alaikum, and shalom in the beginning. I don't know goodbye to all of you and thank you in all of those uh, the, 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 the uh, languages. Uh, I think shukriya, right, is it, is it uh, in Urdu? Uh, and I, I know thank you, Reverend, in English. And uh, Rabbi, help me out here. What's thank you in Hebrew? Toda. Toda. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. My, my, my Jewish family is going to be very angry when they watch this. Uh, okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Thank and once you. again, how millennials can lead us out of the mess we're in. And uh, I love that because we need millennials to lead us out of the mess we're in going forward. The book will be released on October 20th, available for pre-order now at Amazon.com in hardcover or Kindle edition. And where can you get a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim to come together and unite and agree and talk about things from biblical times in the time of Moses that are relevant uh, to today. I think it's awesome. Thank you, Rabbi Mordecai Schreiber. Thank you, Dr. Iqbal J. Yunus. And thank you, Reverend Ian Case Punet. Uh, thank you, Punet. Thank you uh, for joining us. I'm Leslie Marshall. We hope you'll be with us again. And like I said, I hope you will get that book. Go to Amazon.com. Have a great day and great rest of the weekend. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.